art is rarely to me truly maximally expressive in a positive sense most of art for me is a practice of a kind of inhibition and a kind of restraint and a kind of constraint so the very instrument that i submit my hands to is constrained by very set materials and there's something almost machinic about that that i the person the irreducible person submit myself to um, and for me it's precisely within that sort of obedience or that fidelity that constraint that restraint that kind of sharpens and attunes my spirit and my soul and allows me if i work very hard and practice a lot and and and, and truly dedicate myself to it to have the possibility of maybe someday in some situation where other factors external will have to be in play as well to maybe reach that mark of a kind of expression <laughs> all right uh, so today i'm speaking with sam rocha dr sam rocha uh, Sam is an associate professor at the Department of Educational Studies at University of British Columbia. He has written several books, including A Primer for Philosophy and Education, which he has written in both English and Spanish. And I remember you saying that you prefer the Spanish version. You're more happy with that. Uh, I do, yeah. And uh, Tell Them Something Beautiful, which is a collection of essays, and then Folk Phenomenology, and more recently, Syllabus as Curriculum. And Folk Phenomenology is also the title of his upcoming podcast, which I am really excited about. In addition to being a scholar and having an academic life, he's also a musician. And if you go to, if you go on SoundCloud or on YouTube, you can find his lectures and his music. And uh, for the past couple of days, I've been listening to the most recent uh, work you did called the, F the freedom of dialectic which is a strange single track album uh, from beginning to the end it's uh yeah so uh, in addition to all these things which are kind of like static facts in time you can also i i put a link to your bio so if people want to know more about your history they can also find more there so welcome thank you for joining me yes thank you david so Maybe for this conversation, we can begin, at least begin, we don't have to stay, but we can begin with a topic that is, I think, central to your, to, into your work, uh, beginning with a primer, which was the first book I read, the concept of the topic of person, what it means to be a person, and why that is important, why understanding a person or paying attention to the person is important in education yeah so for, for me the this idea or notion of the person is is really central um i suppose two ways to begin to understand why it's central for me is in the first place negative so i use the expression person as a way to distinguish what i'm talking about from other potentially colloquial terms or even in ordinary language synonyms such as an individual or uh, uh, I don't mind this phrasing but I don't it's not my favorite a subject or um, or a human for instance um, I prefer human person for, for instance as a way to refer to uh, the kind of person that, that humans would be um, and what that allows for is for a fairly expansive uh, sensibility where we could consider uh, many or, or at least maybe three kinds of personhood. Uh, the one being the one that you and I probably and most people listening to this, because I assume they'll be human persons. Um, I don't know of any human, non-human persons who get onto YouTube. Uh, so within this world, uh, the, the sort of human person is central. Uh, I come from a religious tradition, though, where we also have a sense of like the persons of the Trinity. Uh, and so this kind of divine or theological transcendent uh, entity of a kind of personhood, angelic personhood, we might say. Um, 
And then I also think that there's in a more ecological, maybe secular sense, uh, senses of sentient life uh, and and non-human persons who maybe are not divine in some sense, but that are uh, uh, a part of us. I have a, I have a pet dog. I have a difficult time excluding um, our, our pets who are such, you know, I, I want a more dramatic example. Our, our cat died. Uh, we only had this cat for very small, about three months, Dolly. And we stood there with Dolly as she was being uh, put down, right? And and I have a difficult time reconciling the emotions of that time as somehow outside of the realm of personhood, right? So, so personhood allows me in this negative sense to begin to both excavate against maybe a certain vocabulary that I want to uh, distinguish it from and also amplify it within this at least tripartite uh, range. But none of this tells you exactly what I think a person is. This is more sort of maybe some of the strategic reasons or some of the kind of uh, the sense of the place, at least the conceptual placement where I see the questions of person coming. Mm. I think the central idea for the person among others, but I think this is one of, is the irreducibility of the person. Mm. So a person is a whole that cannot be reduced to the sum of its parts. So a person is not a machine. A machine is a whole that is literally nothing but the sum of its parts. And so if a part goes missing in a machine, it doesn't function properly. Uh, a person in this sense, uh, I think, is interesting because it's irreducible, and its irreducibility means that some of its parts are perhaps optional, um, mm. and uh, and it makes it more mysterious. You know, I, I, one distinction I'll use to 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 toy with the idea of the person is the distinction between the who, uh, w h o, and the what, w h a t. So, who am I? Well, I answered that question oftentimes with my with my given name, which is Sam. And I've had this name for 38 years. And I think that there's a sense of who-ness, of who I am, that that name gestures towards or sketches uh, that reliably uh, is true across these 38 years. At the same time, many things about me have changed. I have less hair. I have... Uh, uh, a different sized uh, shaped face. Uh, a few weeks ago, I have, I have more uh, hair on my face. I'm wearing a, a certain shirt, certain glasses. Uh, there, I have this tattoo that I didn't right here. These are, these are what's. And if I, sh if I had this interview without my shirt on, it'd be very weird, probably. But it would still be who, I, I would still be me, right? Yes. Um, and so to me, this difference between the who and the what gets us to the conceptual territory of this irreducibility of the person, where it's not an easy formula, I think, to solve uh, what proportion of who-ness or what proportion of whatness. It's simply that the person is a who, who can never be wholly reduced to their whats. They're a mm -hmm. whole that are never... Uh, merely the sum of their parts. And this distinguishes, I think, the person from other composite wholes we might think of, other organisms perhaps, uh, machines for instance, uh, and those kinds of things mm -hmm. um, in, in an important, I think, and consequential way. Now for education, I think this is, this is important for numerous reasons. But the most obvious reason is that whenever we think of education, one of the synonyms that come with education, teaching, schools, curriculum, is this very mysterious word called learning. And if we think of learning within an environment of a machine, such as a computer, for instance, uh, learning is simply the input of, of parts or, or things uh, into the whole and the assimilation of that whole of those parts into itself. And so uh, computers can learn, they can be programmed. Um, many machines can learn because their parts can be adjusted and and attuned and whatnot. In my view, this is this is uh, learning without education. So, in my view, the persons uh, are are not primarily distinguished by this mechanical sense of learning. Uh, this is because of its irreducibility. The person's relationship to learning is 
less reliant upon inputs and outputs and, and a kind of binary ones and zeros and is more reliant on things like like memory mm. uh, and what is the difference between remembering something and knowing something that's mm -hmm. a very difficult question and it's a question that uh brings us i think fully into a zone of what i would call education or at least i would call it education insofar as it pertains to persons and so you can see that in extrinsic i have this inextrinsic link uh between personhood and education for me education is a thing for and by and with persons whereas perhaps there are forms of learning uh, perhaps there are even forms of teaching that really are outside of the zone or the realm of personhood which are nonetheless probably very important uh, but they don't uh, sit within at least uh, the place where I would put my interests so mm. I, I don't well, know yeah. how far that gets us but that, that mm. would be my opening moves I suppose yeah that's a great starting point uh, and for some listeners who may not know some of the more concrete impacts of a discussion like this, uh, we can very briefly refer to uh, things that practices, very common practices in academia, uh, or even in schools, I think, uh, with, the, with the terms like learning objective, which is something that teachers have to communicate with their, you know, the deans or people who are superiors uh, and things that are measured, learning objectives, learning outcomes, and something like a learning objective that is written on a paper or in, on a piece of document in advance that is predetermined before the class even begins. It, it suggests a, a, an approach to education that is machinic, is more mechanistic than personal yes. or personalistic. I would probably add one dimension, which I have to admit has not been a, uh, it hasn't been a, a, a featured part of my thought, especially in my earlier work, but that I've become much more, I, I've, I've come to find that it's important to be added to this. I can almost get lost in this sort of descriptive categorization of personhood and then sort of the appropriate, within that descriptive sensibility, appropriate, um, uh, concepts that go with it that I'll forget about the fact that there is there are some very moral uh, uh, there are, there are things that are morally significant about this and one of them is um, objectification or depersonalization or dehumanization now you know I don't like subject or human but I don't really care actually they're all getting at the same thing which is any time that a person who is marked by their irreducibility is treated like a machine like in your example or like uh, a kind of entity that they are not like and in one of my books i call this ontological disfiguration in other words it's uh treating something that is a certain way in a way that is not only different than the way that it is but a way that goes against its nature and I think that whenever persons are treated uh, as uh, as non-persons or are depersonalized or objectified, um, this is a grave, not only descriptive, or I might say phenomenological, uh, philosophical mistake. It's also a, an ethical problem and because of its moral sight. There's mm -hmm. a philosopher, a Brazilian philosopher, Paulo Freire, who writes a critique of what he calls the banking uh, model of education. And a lot of people, I think, get this wrong. They think he's talking about how is the best way to teach. He has this moment where he says, look, al fondo, at the very bottom of all this, uh, the great archives are people. In other words, ultimately, the banking system doesn't bank knowledge into people's heads mechanically. That's That tends to be the opening moves like you were saying with like you know learning outcomes or objectives and stuff like that but what ends up happening is when people are submitted including teachers by the way to this culture you might say of of objectified depersonalized dehumanizing so-called education not only does it have a sort of ontological disfiguration at its sort of phenomenological bare descriptive level in a morally perhaps more significant way and even i would say in some ways politically significant way um, it 
begins to actually create a great deception mm. where students suddenly believe themselves not to to actually be learners like to be computers where teachers truly begin to think of themselves as the kind of thing or entity that could carry out these orders of computation upon their students and when we get into that situation I think we find ourselves in a very grave moral uh, problem. And that's always motivated my work. But I, I think when I was younger, the conceptual issues were more interesting, perhaps. And so I, I ignored that. And I think now as I'm getting a little bit older, I am starting to realize that I need both of those sides of that. So the question of the person is both a phenomenological question about who, the who, uh, but it's also a moral question, uh, which is more about how, like how should we live and how should we treat each other and how should mm. we educate at mm. that level. Mm. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was, who is very sympathetic to this approach, but uh, she described this position that we are talking about, the attention to personhood as uh, indefensible, relatively indefensible, especially when we are discussing in a, let's say in a department of psychology or in a department of education. And across the table, we have uh, people who are uh, big on quantification and measurement and huh. very uh, firmly establishable criteria of uh, keeping track of their, uh, their approach. And then on, on this side, we have the relatively vulnerable and dif more difficult to keep track of. And even, even when you talked about your cat, there was this sense of vulnerability that detecting a person, treating some, someone, uh, even alluding to that someone as a, in terms of a person and in, in personhood terms, who not only, it's not only a way of detecting what is out there, who is out there, but also becoming vulnerable, becoming susceptible, responsive in a way that is, doesn't happen when we are measuring and quantifying and keeping track of objective and criteria. Sure. I mean, would you agree with the indefensibility? I agree with it at a large scale. Obviously the, the quantification of, I mean, for a person to be irreducible is also to me that it's unquantifiable, right? Sure. There's, yes. There's no, uh, the, the, the mathematical metaphor, which we use, very productively within statistical measurement and analysis and the very idea of measurements, which in, entails an idea of commensurability and all of these sort of like deeply nested uh, metaphysical s stories and symbols that we're exchanging whenever we talk this way, uh, they all come up short. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, same, yeah. So, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. And even like part of that, methods that rely on that way of thinking, they rely on the participants own agreement that, okay, I, I'm agreeing to regard my happiness or my friendliness along a scale from a scale from zero to 10. And then that itself is a very, it's an amazing uh, ability on, on the side of the person that we are trying to measure that they it's agree. It's very yeah. funny, honestly, yeah. like when I see the Likert scales and stuff, it it's, it's to me as, um, I'm going to use a word that's very uh, politically incorrect, but I'm going to use it maybe in its pejorative, politically incorrect sense. It's a very primitive thing to, to imagine that human beings with freedom and wills and, and intellect um, could sit before an instrument that says, you know, rate on a on a on a on a whole number numeric scale of one to ten x uh thing which you're supposed to know about yourself to begin with you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just find it very funny honestly it's it's to me it's as hilarious as as uh so i find it funny where it's not funny is that people it seems to have acquired a certain kind of realist purchase upon society and people seem to actually believe it but i think that actually it would probably be fine if we treated it appropriately which is as a kind of 
you know, pseudoscience. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, I think there's actually a productive sense of pseudoscience to be had where like it's it's a it's approximate. It's like talking to someone about wine. Mm. And they're invoking all of these flavors and aromas and things. And and it's almost like a poetics of 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 color and texture and stuff. And it's all basically because we don't have a very robust vocabulary to about the, the aesthetic experience of wine drinking. I think in some sense, the social sciences and especially the quantifying psychometric uh, disciplines, they're the sommeliers of, of the human experience, which frankly, I drink cheap beers. So like, it's not a very, I think it's very funny when I hear a sommelier talk about wine and stuff. And I suppose some, in some cases I feel that woody corresponds to what I had in my mouth. But for the most part, it's just an interesting human exchange that has very low capacity to acquire a kind of descriptive mm. um, bottling of, mm. of the human condition. And I think that if we could only lower our expectations and standards, and if the psychometricians and the economists and the people using quantification would be willing to humble themselves like the artist does, like I'm sure the culinary arts do, uh, like I think most everyone does. Uh, I think we could have something good come out of that. Unfortunately, though, that's not what we have right now. And because of that, we're people like me even have to, and I know you, <laughs> we have to become very aggressive to sort of uh, try to... Um, Hum, humble these people by a kind of force, but I'll, I'll be honest, I've become even weary of that project myself. Mm. I'm I'm sick of, hu- of trying to humiliate this thing that to me is so obviously incapable of doing something, and I have nothing, of course, to stand in its in its in its place, right? Um, uh, I have no instruments, certainly, that could uh, do what what it tries to do, and at that level, I admire it. You know, like when I read Frankenstein. I have a difficult time completely uh, making fun of uh, Dr. Frankenstein's ambition and madness and desire and 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 that genuine spark of of the human spirit. You know why? Because I'm a creative person. I like to make things, you know, and and he tried to make a, a creature, <laughs> mm. a sentient creature. He tried to make a person which violates the very first rule of personhood. <laughs> mm. um, but uh, but I also admire that, you know, uh, this goes all the way back to that, that uh, man is the measure of all things, you know, that Greek sensibility that, you know, the gods are not the measure of all things. We are. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to rest free from this determinist, uh, divinized playing some capacity for human freedom. I mean, that's that's really beautiful. And in that respect, I have a lot of uh, respect, even for the educational project of, of a kind of objectification, of a kind of depersonalization. The fact that we can depersonalize each other and ourselves is a sign of our personhood, no question. Mm-hmm. It's all a matter of degree, and this is where the moral question comes in. And of also the moral context. And that's something that I'm only now becoming more attuned to and more aware of that I used to, I think, mm. uh, pass over too easily. Mm. You talked about first names or proper given names, proper names. Yeah. Uh, and I think implicit in our ability to use proper names appropriately in the right way is already an understanding of possible changes, including very dramatic changes in a person who keeps their name. Of course, they can change their name. That's uh, dramatic in a different way. But we already understand what it means for a person to remain the same person while going through a lot of transformations. And we still call them with with their names. Uh, And so that's one way in which we can maintain the visibility of a person. Keep, Keep in mind that we are dealing with the person. Are there other ways similar to this proper name that you, you can that you practice or you keep in mind as a kind of mental practice that keeps the visibility, the person visible? 
and doesn't let it become invisible in the discourse of the measurements yeah. and yeah. well i th i think that another one of the words that is often used for this idea of personhood is the language of the self mm -hmm. or selfhood mm -hmm. which which seems to point towards the ego or just the i am mm -hmm. this kind of existential very inside uh docile heidegger's term level for the the possessive character of myself that i am myself and no one else is quite me and i think the the expression of identity often both individual or singular identity and then group identities from there um this is really tricky territory to me it's a territory that i also like the expression person because i think it in some ways gestures towards the fact that um this is a very yeah. complex place of identity singular and plural identity social identity i think culture comes out of that and many other things but i don't think it's the only um i don't think it has a monopoly over questions of personhood and what i mean here specifically is that um i think one of the most powerful ways in which we um identify ourselves as being persons is not so much by through positive identification but precisely by an ability to uh to change and even to give away and give up um our positive senses of who we are so i think over time um a lot of the expressions of personhood uh come from these negative certainties that we that we acquire mm -hmm. of 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 who we're not of what we don't like um i think our desires in many cases drive so much of this and i think so much of desire is a matter of a certain kind of negative or at least very vague certainty that is only sharpened by by loss and so and by loss here i mean a loss of certain kinds of characteristics and so you know there's something to me really interesting about the developmental arc of the person let's say across 80 90 years right um is that the two ends of of developmental life for a person are um are years of of great weakness and uh and of fragility and a vulnerability like you said and these are never absent entirely through the middle because of mortality you know and so i think that 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 in many cases facing our mortality facing our fragility um is what builds the most powerful idea i believe we have for personhood which is the idea of the soul mm. and i prefer this idea to the self because the soul is immortal the soul is eternal the the doctrine of the soul is in some sense i think our our coping mechanism for our fragility for our uh for our weakness and and this wow. sense of soul of spirit for instance uh to to me is an expression of is the maximal expression of personhood mm. um and in concretely i place this within the arts so for me there's a major difference between the plastic arts the arts where i create an object right uh i say i paint something and i put it up on my wall or i sculpt something and i have it there i can sell it at the fair or something mm -hmm. ceramics and the spiritual arts which are the arts where there's nothing left where mm -hmm. where one is only giving something away and it's spiritual in the most simple sense of that it's not material it's not something that you can grab a hold of and put on a table later mm -hmm. and to me that expression of of the spiritual arts the arts of song the arts of music the arts of dance the arts of movement um the arts of oral language and orality uh that precede text and book and all those things these are to me the the great um mm -hmm. the 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 greatest markers even more than our proper names in fact our proper names participate in that art of 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 of, of orality and of naming and of and of language making mm -hmm. uh and that to me is really the uh 
the place where the person uh, comes to be, and it happens to also be the place of education. Mm. Uh, education is the call and the response. Education is uh, s- spiritual to me, ultimately. Mm. It s- sounds like we can describe all the arts in terms of a general term that they are all arts of soulfulness. They are all different ways of achieving uh, the state of being soulful. It reminded me of this. Uh, part there's a book recent book about william james which you recommended to me to read by john cake and yeah. uh, i'm reading it and i'm really enjoying it so far on chapter three there's a, a quote uh, from william james that says if you like to he's, he doesn't say he's like as a confident statement he says i'm thinking about this i'm getting more and more confident about this uh, assumption that if you want to get to know someone very well the best way is to find out the situations in which they feel most fully and most intensely alive and that reminded me of what you said about the the artistic pursuits and soul yes with with one base with one probably it's difficult in james's thought to know if this is an exception or a so some people, when they think of arts, and you can think about the arts on a distinction between the aesthetic and the anesthetic. So the aesthetic is what sort of gives gives life or, or, or fills spirit or soul. And the anesthetic is precisely that which deadens or causes sleep or slumber. Mm-hmm. Um, they're both very important to human experience. Uh, we need to sleep and we need to be uh, awake. And there are degrees of being awake in our sleep and there are degrees of being asleep when we're awake and language has beautiful juxtapositions when someone in basketball can't miss we say they're unconscious <laughs> mm. but it's a height it's a you're right whereas we have other places to so there's there's a wit at, at play insofar as we're using words to traverse these ideas uh at you know, and to that degree, if we pay too much attention to that, we'll end up just only talking about language. But I tend to resist that move myself. Mm. But I admit it's it's kind of the water we're swimming in here, at least. Mm. Um, but one proviso I put on the art point that you made. Mm. And in this case, I mean, this is largely born from my practice as a guitarist, as a songwriter. But it maybe better informs what I said earlier about the arts is that Art is rarely, to me, truly, maximally expressive in a positive sense. Most of art, for me, is a practice of a a kind of inhibition and a kind of restraint and a kind of constraint. So the very instrument that I submit my hands to is constrained by very set materials. And there's something almost machinic about that, that I, the person, the irreducible person, submit myself to. Um, And for me, it's precisely within that sort of obedience or that fidelity, that constraint, that restraint, that kind of sharpens and attunes my spirit and my soul and allows me if I work very hard and practice a lot and, 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 and truly dedicate myself to it, to have the possibility of maybe someday in some situation where other factors external will have to be in play as well, to maybe reach that mark of a kind of expression. But I think it's very difficult to express ourselves. And I think one of the great lies of the arts, a popular understanding of the arts and even of education, is that expression is sort of like constantly happening. I think expression is rarely happening because we don't know who we are, because we don't, we, we don't understand anything. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, everything is so difficult. So for me, like, so when I, my students come to UBC and they have to get these things called research questions, and I, I don't know what those are exactly. I assign a research question to all my students. Say, this mm-hmm. is your research question. What are the desires of my heart? That's your research question. Why? Because if you can answer that with even the tiniest amount of potential authenticity, then whatever results of that will not be fake, will not be bullshit to the same degree that it would have been 
if you would have tried to literally invent some fantastical projection of someone else's desires upon you in the form of a research question, right? So all I'm saying is that like, yes to art, but no to a kind of ease of expression or to a kind of celebration of a kind of performativity or whatnot. Mm -hmm. To be an artist, Rilke in his letters to a young poet, you know, I think he tells the poet basically like, look, if you can do anything else other than be a poet, do it. Because the only reason to be a poet is that you would kill yourself if you didn't. That's the only good reason, you know. Uh, Wittgenstein's um, The Duty of Genius by Ray Monk. The, uh, the duty of genius is essentially be a genius or kill yourself. These are the... And genius in this case doesn't mean high IQ. It, it means sort of like be a person or be yourself or something like that. Or, mm. or don't, <laughs> mm. you know. Um, and so there's a kind of vitalism sometimes, especially in the Americans and especially in James, that I think romanticizes a bit too much the aesthetic and the artistic. And Keg flirts with that sometimes too much for my taste. So I'm just mm -hmm. correcting it a bit here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you were talking about expression and expressing, uh, I, I started wondering about the role of audience, uh, both in classroom as when you when we express ourselves as teachers and uh, as a musician, do you sense any role in in the audience in bringing out expressions in you that you couldn't achieve without them or the kinds of audience? And I'm asking that partly because when you ask your students to to answer the question, what are the desires of your heart? What you're doing is one of the things that that question achieves is that it switches the audience in the in the person's mind, like. You don't have to answer to that audience, answer to a different kind of audience by asking this question. So a general yes. question about audience. Yeah, so audience, I'm gonna play a, 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 a philosopher's trick. Mm -hmm. It's a trick of etymology, which I'm, I'm like. <laughs> I love so, it, yeah. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm so suspicious of it because I use it so much and it's so effective. So I always have to put this preamble that this is a trick it should not be accepted uh, out of hand, but but audience is is a word that has I think some meaning left in its etymological roots because it audire means to listen, and so I think an audience is is uh, who is is listening, mm -hmm. and there's this expression of hineni. It's a it's a Hebrew word, uh, which uh, it's like here I am or I am here. And and it's an expression telling the divine, speak, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. It's, I am your audience, right? I am your listener in that sense. I think that the external sense of audience is, a, is, is, is an encouragement for the speaker to speak in a way, to speak in the manner in which one can be listened to. So to speak with a kind of love, a kind of concern, a kind of care for, for one's listener, right? Um, I think, though, whenever one turns this internally, I think we, we can forget many times that we also need to listen to ourselves. Mm. Um, and so to speak in such a way that I can bear to hear myself speak is I think sometimes even more difficult than to speak to the sort of the other on the outside. Emerson has this, I think, badly misunderstood essay called Self-Reliance, where he talks about how inside every human person, there's this iron string that vibrates. And I, I think here of like a big, thick piano string, you know, that vibrates. And that that iron string inside every person is is god and is the divine and so self-reliance means to hear the voice of god not on the outside not in the heavens not in your brother and sister but on the inside of your soul which is deep down inside in that vibrating iron string nietzsche frederick nietzsche a great lover of emerson he calls this the acoustic designation of genius hmm. It says before one can become a genius, in the same sense I think that Wittgenstein was thinking of it, um, one has to be able to literally, sonically, feel the vibration 
of music in their in their breast and their chest mm. and this capacity to, to somatically assimilate spirit is a kind of precondition i think for nietzsche of uh, of life and so for me audience is both externally a concern for for one's voice and a sense of responsibility and ability to respond to the call of the other what is the call of the other that listens it's speak <laughs> mm. listening right but i think it's also an internal capacity uh to to listen to oneself and to even listen to oneself by by excluding one's more perhaps uh excluding the 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 forms of selfhood that one that are at the surface of one's personhood but to try to reach all the way down kind of like a good deep breath right into that iron string zone where perhaps we encounter something like what augustine in his little book de magistro calls the inner teacher which for mm. augustine the inner teacher was christ but he says his whole dialogue is that there is no teacher but the inner teacher and i find this to be very true as a teacher you the teacher can never speak in such a way to the student such that they can cause causally the student to learn the only thing this teacher can do is to perhaps move the student to go within themselves and acquire something from mm -hmm. what has been offered on the outside but i mm -hmm. think this internal movement of education in other words i think i'm i'm i think there's a, a broadly externalist account of education which in the a kind of most vulgar senses are the kind of machinic learnings and objectifying and dehumanizing things we've talked about mm -hmm. but even within sort of very social or relational accounts of education when the audience is always external and the other is always you know interpersonal mm -hmm. political I think we actually lose that deeper internalist account of education where mm -hmm. we find a different kind of audience, a different kind of listener, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe even a different kind of inner uh, being, uh, which also, I mean, I'm sorry, I keep not dropping examples, but they're just, they're useful. Augustine in the very first uh, uh, book of his confessions, he, he juxtaposes that, you know, God is, is big and he's in the heavens and, the, and, 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 and greater than 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 the cosmos and and that this giant entity the divine how is it that it that in in the scriptures where he reads it it says that that giant thing lives in my tiny human little heart how do you get all of that stuff in that thing and for him it's this it's this mystery of, of scale between the god who created heavens and the earth and this tiny little voice inside. And and how did that one get up here? And how did this little one manage to do all that out there? That That's the big and the small, the in and the out, the inside and the outside. This to me is what audience gestures toward, which, um, which I think is important to have a sense of transcendence in, if only because it allows us to more radically encounter each other as persons. Mm -hmm. in addition to other religious reasons or, or theological ones one might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the idea of the inner teacher i think could be juxtaposed with that uh, idea which is that a book title that i have not read and i i don't have access to unfortunately because i think it is out of print and it's not available as an ebook the title yeah. is uh, teacher as a stranger by oh, i think yeah. green maxine maxine green, maxine maxine green. A copy. i have a copy i can send you by pdf oh thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you and i i think that we can juxtapose it and come up with the, the inner stranger uh, the teacher yes. the, as the inner stranger well no one is stranger to the to to any person than themselves okay. at least yeah yeah I at least that is, is yeah easiest to grasp the strangeness of ourselves is is easiest it's uh, easiest to grasp but it, precisely because it's sort of very close it's almost mm -hmm. impossible to to even begin to 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 comprehend i think mm. know thyself that socratic dictum is is really meant to be the <laughs> the most sublime but also the most impossible of all the sort of doctrines of philosophy mm. and, and I, I i really do maintain as an almost dogmatic proposition that that uh, 
Anyone who, who tells you that they know themselves is a liar or a fool. And, and, <laughs> and that we really should reject this idea that the self or the person or the human or whatever is uh, something that, that is self-possessive. For me, this is a, at best a sign of a kind of radical kind of self-deception. And ultimately, mm -hmm. it could be very harmful. I think when the teacher, for instance, faces the student and admits that only the inner teacher can teach you. So what am I doing here? Well, at that moment, they give away something. But I think they also achieve a kind of authority that really can't be earned in any other way. Mm. Uh, the, only t the only way the teacher can teach the student, which is, of course, impossible because no one can teach but the inner teacher, so the only option is for the teacher to sort of admit defeat at the very beginning and then accept that they're not never going to teach and 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 then and and take it from there. And so for me, you know, to be a person is to accept the defeat that we that know thyself is an impossible dictum and so we begin there and it, and we and we start there mm -hmm. and we end there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But it makes it more serious. This isn't by the way cynicism nor is it a sense of, of I am, I'm all for tragedy. But this to me isn't a tragedy. For me, this is a key. Anyone who doesn't reach this, I don't think they even start. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. But it is difficult. It's difficult to maintain that orientation and maintain the, the belief that we are not there and we will never be there. Uh, to, be, to, be, to work under that assumption, I think it takes time. I think it takes, uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely takes time. I think this is where traditions are really helpful. Mm. And I think there's traditions of many kinds. There's traditions of labor, traditions of food, folk, uh, folk ways of, of being. And, and uh, I think religions are among the, uh, the most uh, storied, probably. Um, but I, I do believe that there are very ordinary and very enduring practices and ways of living, and even ways of, of like like strict ways of living, like rules uh, for life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that exist for the sole purpose of reminding us that we do not know ourselves, and we must continually seek that knowledge, which we won't attain, and that that sort of that journey or that 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 odyssey, that pilgrimage is what makes life in some sense worthwhile you know mm -hmm. um to me this is this is a a place where we can in some cases i think this is where philosophy is born from and and letters especially literary letters uh literature is born from but i don't think we have to simply remain there i think we can see uh, this and 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 many forms of of life and ways of life and and, and traditions that carry a little bit of a kind of a battle tested uh, portrait and, mm. uh, and and conventions for ourselves. Mm. So I'm, I'm a great lover of traditions, and to me, tradition has nothing to do with the past. Mm. Um, to me, traditions ultimately, when people start getting nostalgic about the past, I think they've abandoned tradition. Uh, for me, tradition is, is all about the future. Um, for me, the whole point of a future is, is tradition. Uh, otherwise, what's the point, right? Mm. Uh, it's the same sensibility, I think, in this idea of genius from Wittgenstein or from Nietzsche or mm. from Emerson. Right? Mm -hmm. so. Interesting. I, I would like to ask more questions about that. But for, my, for the final question for this conversation, yeah. I'd like to ask you about... Your experience, is anything that comes to mind you'd like to share or anything striking about your uh, recent experience uh, as, a, uh, as a podcast uh, host yes. having these conversations? Yeah, go ahead. Very excited about this because I'm about to record my first solo uh, portion for the podcast, which mm -hmm. is to talk about the interview and... Mm -hmm. And I have to make decisions. I have to decide, do I take the word up and I tear it between inter and view? And I kind of open it, kind of break it apart 
in order to kind of make it strange and then work from it from there? Mm. Or do I start with the familiar of like, well, most for most of us and for me for a long time, the interview was a place to try and get a job mm. where I would try to give answers to someone that, that I, I hoped at least they would like sufficiently such that they would hire me. Mm. Um, or, or or perhaps I talk about the interviews that make up the the podcast, which which the most of the podcast is dedicated to interviews with people of different kinds, and what that experience was like, and leave out the kind of preambles and just jump into what that was like. Um, so, so all that to say, I'm excited to talk about this, only to say that um, since I'm not a social scientist, and since I've been such a kind of flamboyantly anti-social science person. I think I've I've neglected a lot of the intimacy of social science, especially within the art of interviewing mm -hmm. and and uh, and of speaking with a person, uh, not not so much aimlessly, but kind of trying to be a respectful companion, guiding their words and their reflections in such a way that. Um, that the listener, <laughs> that the mm -hmm. audience is maybe able, but also sometimes going in and really just spending time with that person. You know? mm. um, when you said intimacy, do you mean as opposed to uh, so solitary uh, work? Yes, or... yes, exactly, okay. exactly okay. that. Mm -hmm. um, so much of my work, uh, this is why the classroom is so important, but the classroom mm. for me is a bit of a pulpit. It's a bit of a, of a place for me to almost speak into a kind of void mm -hmm. where the student and their freedom can fill or they can choose not to. I'm, I'm absolutely opposed to telling my student that they should <laughs> do almost anything really, mm -hmm. except for if they're going to, they have to do everything. Right. But for me, it's, a, it's a sort of, you know, if I speak into a void then they can either fill that void or they can say, you know what, this is a bit much. I'm going to sit back. I did my reading. I'm very tired or, you know, to me that the environment of freedom is conducive to that. But in an interview, you don't have those kinds of silly pedagogical distances and things. You have two persons who are, who are talking to each other. You have the intimacy of the bar, you know, and, and you have the pauses and you're kind of timing each other out. And so you're dancing uh, and then you have the ideas and oftentimes whenever a person I was interviewing would talk, my, my head would just overfill with ideas, but I don't want to interrupt them because that's very rude. And so I would wait, but by the time they were done and they paused and I felt I could jump in, my head had too many ideas. And so my inclination was to say, well, these are the seven ideas that I have. Mm. Choose whichever one you'd like to run with mm. and I'll take, I'll run with you and leave those behind. And mm -hmm. then they would, and I'd run with them. And then I'd be like, I'm very sorry, but I have to go back for that last one because it's even more important now than it was. And so I'd go get it. So I think as an interviewer, I'm pretty crazy. Um, I, uh, I'm often also more impressionistic. I'm not really asking questions. I'm more saying, if I say that, you know, uh, love is blind and then I also say that it's kind of funny that we might go extinct because of our reliance on dinosaurs uh, through fossil fuels. You know, how does that make you feel? Or like, it's almost this kind of psychoanalytic, like almost free association. And, and what I have to rely on, though, is, is a trust of a stranger in almost all these cases, people I didn't know, to kind of, it like it's like a being on a bandstand, really. Uh, with with another player where you know if you're going to suddenly decide to really push the song you have to trust that your rhythm section is going to come along or that they're going to pull against you and you're going to fight it out up there and that tension is going to release into something else afterwards and so you know for me those were the mm. those were very much the uh the sensations of it all but in the end i thought i i came away with some really clear uh teachings i learned that that my resistance to violence within political discussions and direct action had uh somehow uh receded than it had in the past and i think a lot of that had to do with the subject matter of of, of anti-black racism and the 
the reciprocity of violence in the face of enslavement or things like that. It didn't have the same maybe off-putting liberal uh, reaction in me. Uh, but I found that very interesting because in the past it's been something that I've always responded against very strongly. Um, all my interviews on the podcast uh, of the Central 12 interviews are all with women. Um, and I made a choice to do that. And I don't want to essentialize too much across it. But I was very aware of the fact that I was the man in the interview. And there are some things that men do. So I hear <laughs> that... Uh, that that are that are that are not good like uh talking over people like uh, mm. uh ex over explaining things to people and and so i found that that it put me in a very um slightly defensive and even somewhat um precarious position and i appreciated being uh being careful uh and and not being aggressive i also did some debates with with men as it happens to be mm. uh, it wasn't a choice to do that but that's the way it came out I actually had a cancellation which turned it into that but what i found there is that i i wanted to trust my listener to sort of to keep their score at home mm -hmm. and not to try to advertise what i felt were my my wins along the way mm -hmm. um, and nonetheless i also wanted to sort of gently guide my interlocutor into mm -hmm. some points of of alignment that I didn't really feel they could, they would be able to recover from. And I found that they were often very generous about sort of being led there, noticing where they were and kind of conceding some ground to move in another direction. And I kind of let that go. And, and, uh, and then one last thing, I guess, and this was very concrete, uh, towards the end of the interview, whenever I noticed it was ending, I would begin to kind of hover over the stop button and see mm. if I could kind of curate in vivo with them what that last word would be and really listen to them and i found that it forced me into a kind of mode of listening that was even more intense than the di the mode of dialoguing because i was just waiting for them to to say something great and mm. there's something very very superstitious and kind of stupid about this whole like you're rooting for them as you're listening to them but we have an expression in Spanish called echarle ganas. Ganas means desire or want to. Um, gana means like win or gain. So it's like, it's it's something, it's a weird word for, for to translate. But to echarle ganas means to work hard or to throw your desire or your want to at something. Mm -hmm. And I felt like listening to them, I was both kind of listening to them saying, Echale ganas, like, you know, come on, you can do it. You're almost to the end. But also throwing a lot more of my desires and probably my projected desires for the show, for for my life, for this time, for this evening, for, you know, into that. And so whenever I reached that point where like, yes, we got it, I would end it and they and I would never tell them. So then they would just like be talking and I'd be like, and they'd be like, this recording is over. And they, they and they were like, what happened? I was like, you did it. Great job. You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so they had no idea, of course, that that was happening. And so then I would explain to them. And, and you know, some of them were kind of like weird. And yeah, others, that's unusual. Like, okay, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's unusual technique. because you could have done that afterwards. Like after the recording you could have yes, cut could have yeah, yeah 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 no i didn't but it was yeah as you said en vivo yeah yeah wow and, and the place where that became more most dramatic and i think the most dramatic response i got to it was that i said you know what i even want to do this in, in the debates in fact i want to do it even more in the debates because i want to give my interlocutor in this non-mediated critical discussion about things of which we overtly and kind of fiercely disagree, I want to really make them feel like they were treated with, with respect. You know? mm. And so I, I remember doing it with a person who I've debated very publicly, uh, Trent Horn. Mm. And, and when I, I cut it, the question was like, what is the good life? You know, and he gave his, his version of the good life. And I'm not inclined to actually debate people's views of the good life. It, it's interesting to me in and of itself. I, 
and so I just let him, you know, say his piece, and then I, I cut it, and he was shocked. He was ready for the rebuttal. He was ready. He was still kind of still in a in a more agonistic exchange, and I had already given up, and I was happy mm. for him and said, "Good job," you know, and and I think he was a bit um, surprised by that, but I think it, it was it was a, a positive surprise for us. It was it was a gesture of a kind of goodwill, and mm. and hopefully when people hear the interviews, they'll. Uh, They'll be able to see kind of what that's all about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how it goes yeah i'm really looking forward to them uh folk phenomenology once again i will yeah uh, i will leave links below uh to your youtube soundcloud and other places sure. well thank you so much for joining me and i hope we do this again maybe at a future point we can center the conversation around uh, religion or spirituality or family or you know other topics that you know we're interested in absolutely all right so thank you so much yeah cheers <laughs>